So a little over two years ago, uh, my brother Diaz and his wife Yusuf and Yusuf's sister Razan were in their apartment top of the hill where they were murdered. It's been a very long two years. Uh, you feel all kinds of feelings, you feel all kinds of anger, sadness, anything. Um, so when I was in Greensboro, North Carolina, um, I was on Facebook. I saw one of my friends posted about Nabra and, and the situation unfolding in Virginia. Can you guys hear me? Is this? Is this yeah. You guys can hear me? Don't matter. Um, so it was unfolding on Facebook. I, I learned about the 17 year old. Um, she was in a group of 15 others. So I was like, someone's family is shattered today. There is the friends, especially the friends that were with her that night, going to support. I felt like especially them. If I can get to them, again, I've been through it. Um, two years on and you still kind of learn lessons. You still kind of go through all the difficulties. So the idea was maybe I could go there and help out and make some friends. Um, and I did that up until I had a flight here. Um, I landed in Oakland, drove by the Warrior Stadium. I will say I'm a big fan. Congratulations on that championship. Um, in fact, Steph Curry had, um, uh, you probably might know this, um, when my brother was murdered, his, his profile picture on, on Facebook was of his wedding six weeks earlier, and it was of him kind of posed, kind of just like Steph Curry with the basketball um, for a GQ magazine cover. And anyway, Steph Curry at the end of like some kind of three-point contest or something after he, of course, broke a record, um, spoke about my brother, in fact, mentioned my brother's name, which to me was just mind-boggling and sign some shoes that he wore and set them to us. So that's another reason I'm a huge fan of the Warriors and they deserve this win 100%. So what brings me here is Alhamdulillah, my sister just had a baby boy a little over three weeks ago. His cousins are here as well. Um, so the idea was I got to meet my nephew for the first time. And again, in the two years with, this, with, with that, there's also life. And, um, there's still difficulties, I'm not saying there's not like lingering difficulties, but alhamdulillah to see like life kind of come in. So we have a little boy in the family called Adam Jenda. That's the same. I kind of struggle to kind of identify exactly what to talk to you guys about today. Some of you guys are rather young. Um, I think it's just supposed to be for 12 to 18 year old, year old, but I know there's some younger folks. And I don't know, difficult topics like like death and murder and, and all that. Like, I don't know if it's appropriate necessarily for the younger folks. Um, but there are definitely some things we can talk about. Um, and in fact, um, I'd rather hear from you guys as well on like, to what extent I can talk about this stuff. So I don't, I don't want to kind of go into too much and then you guys go home to your mom crying, like, oh, this guy talked about guns and whatever and have nightmares. I don't want you to guys have nightmares. Um, but I also don't want to miss out on talking about a very important topic. Um, I think what was kind of the same about both the Ayusha and Razan and their story and Navra and her story was that each of us saw ourselves in them or saw our siblings in them. The parents, they saw their kids in them. You know, so many kids are out in college doing their best, trying to do what they want to do. Everybody wants to become a doctor. So the fact that my, my brother is already in dental school, Ayusha just got accepted. They just got married. They're just a kid born here. The idea was like, that's just, that could be any one of us. With Nabra, again, who doesn't do so hope? I mean, y'all, some of y'all might be a little too young, but dude, going to IHOP at night, that's like the best part of Ramadan, for real. You do your, you do your tarawih, you do your bit, but you go to IHOP, you get the pancakes, the chocolate chips, um, and then you head back to the masjid to continue some of your worship, and especially among great friends. Um, all the friends are together to, to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what it happened. She was on the way to IHOP and on the way back, it happened. And that's what was scary about it. And that's what kind of resonates with all of us. And I think that leaves a lot of us scared. Um, as I was saying, I was in Greensboro. I had a friend of mine who was doing like a fundraiser, his family was. So I asked him if he wanted to come with me. It's like a five and a half hour drive from North Carolina to Virginia. And he said, yes, he'll come. All right. So we need to close down the banquet hall in 15 minutes here. So let's work hard again. Banquet hall.
Done. Any youth that are here, let's start heading into the conference room. Adults, if you want to join as well, they're talking uh, to a really special speaker tonight. Let's talk about this. By the way, special is really done with Justin. Like, to, for you guys to have him, I don't know how often he's here, but you guys have some awesome speakers. And plus, the number of kids out here, this is crazy. There's a lot of kids. Um, but you guys are, looks like some sharp minds. Um, so where was I? I was talking about, I was in Greensboro with my friend, and I asked him if he'd drive up with me. The idea was it's, I hadn't slept basically the night before, and maybe we can share some of the driving, and I'll tell you right now, the best car to ever own is a Honda Odyssey, because you can put the seats down in the back and just lay down and sleep. Not a Mustang, not a, I don't know, whatever car y'all think about is cool. The absolute coolest car you can have is a what? Uh, yes! Honda Odyssey. Um, that's actually where we slept the first night. We got to Adam Center for Veget, we just slept in the back of the van. <laughs> that's how cool it is. Um, okay. Um, so he came up with me this back up plot hub. And when we got back, what made me really kind of sad was that what he was kind of, his sister, who's in medical school, um, sent the Snapchat of, of, her, of Balha basically wearing like uh, boxing gloves and was like coming at her and he said, defend yourself. And he was trying to teach her like how to defend herself in a situation where, you know, out of kind of random, a situation may kind of uh, come into a situation where you just don't know how to respond and you're faced with this enormous amount of violence. And as much as it could be scary for the guys, y'all have to realize how hard it is for the girls here, um, for these young ladies, um, because you always kind of wonder why the person is being especially violent. We understand that, like, you know, we got, like, a moron president in office, right? So let me just say this. Like, if he could be president, you can too. <laughs> that, that's the best part about it. If he could be president, you can too. Um, so we have a situation where, like, we don't know if we're being targeted because we're Muslim or not, but Muslim women can feel on the day-to-day -day that they're being harassed, sometimes for especially kind to them for it, sometimes not so much. So when faced with violence, you're also wondering, you know, what is what is going on? Why is this person swinging the baseball bat? Um, and kind of the gist of what happened in Virginia was that, like, it was like a group of 15 kids walking back, somewhere on bicycles, the dude driving might have been drunk or something, and I don't know the exact details. I think it's good to say I don't know. And a lot of you guys just say I don't know and you don't know. Um, but the idea was he either came in the lane or did something to where he came into the bike lane, and there was like between one of the kids, um, there was some kind of like argument, like kind of yelling back and forth. And then he somehow ended up chasing him. And Nabra was the one he ended up catching, and again and ended up killing him. And it's like why, like. You know, I, I think a lot of people can wonder, like, you know, if I spilled coffee on the wrong guy, is he going to get angry enough to kill me? And you're kind of worried, you're worried about that. You don't know what people are thinking. And I think that's the situation we're in today. Um, you know, with the murders of my brother, the guy who did it was like this guy who just like completely hated religion, all of it. So there, there are all kinds of people out there. There is a lot of good people. There's a lot of people who obviously care for Nabra who stood up for her, for the interfaith community. People who condemn it right off the bat, no problem. So many people who wish they said they could have been there to do something. And especially those like other 14 kids or whatever, like I met some of them, and especially one of them, she's still angry today. She was saying, maybe I should have gone back and done something. But is that a healthy attitude to have? Can you guys tell me, if you guys were there, would you have said, oh, I wish I had gone back, I wish I had done something different? You want to do something different, but you shouldn't kind of go down that route. You shouldn't go down this idea of doubt, of not being sure. Because really, like, who planned it? Who wrote exact details of what was going to happen? God did. It was exactly how it was supposed to go down. We think that we're, like, superhuman after the fact. So this little, like, 14-year-old girl, was it? The, the girl that was with Navra? So she's young, she's high school, and she's thinking, she's beating herself up about why she didn't go back and help. She said maybe 10 people could have, you know, overpowered the one guy with the bat. But we're afraid, we don't know what's happening. You run for your life, that's what you do. So don't go back, ever kind of regret is kind of what I told her. 
Because that's what I do with my brother. Like, there are so many instances where I could have, like, just shown regret. But I think that would have added one more victim. I don't want to be a victim to this. I believe thoroughly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is behind it. Because obviously, like, to me, it just didn't make sense. When it happened, my first Facebook status was, you know, I, I think it was like a couple, like six hours after the murders that they confirmed the address and then they confirmed my identity. I was like, yes, this happened, but I don't understand it, but I don't have to understand it. Because God is the most wise. That means some of the things that he's going to understand in his wisdom that we're just not going to. So I left it at that. And I didn't allow regret. I didn't allow any of that to kind of seep in. And then obviously, like, some people kind of took it a little differently. Some some people in my family, for example, and again, this is two families. My brother, his wife, who's Yusa, and Razan, her sister. Brother Dawood spoke about the fidget spinner last time. Y'all are the young folks in the group. Please don't distract the older folks. Um, I, I kind of lost my train of thought. What was I saying, guys? This is a test to see if you guys are even paying attention. Like, too many people saying something. <laughs> yeah, so the different ways that we kind of dealt with the situation. So, you know, some of my family members and the Muslim family, like, some of them just, I think, like, took, you know, the, the actual physical nature of it a little too much. Um, some... Some, in a sense, thought about the bigger picture. What do we know about martyrs, shuhada, right? What do y'all know about that? I'm not trying to bring this topic up if you don't know enough about it already. They go straight to heaven. Uh, say it louder. They go straight to heaven. They go straight to heaven. So there's a lot of, like, if life literally is a test, right? If we're here to just say, like, you know, or think of it as a bridge. Before you're born, our souls were somewhere. During life... We're given this body, you know, this physical body, my hand that I'm able to put up right now. Like, this is on loan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This isn't my body. This is just a, a vehicle, a vessel, a car that, that gets me through to the other side of the bridge. And then your soul leaves this body, this temporary being, and goes to Jannah. If that's all that life is about, then there's more to think about than just what happened that night. And it doesn't end there. There's that uh, Paul Walker song. You guys know it? Somebody want to sing that for me real quick? Somebody knows it. Who's a good singer? Actually, I'm like quite impressed by the number of like good singers these days. Can you sing for us? I'm a terrible singer. <laughs> Somebody can sing? My cousin right here. Mansoor, you can sing? Yeah. He's in choir. He's in choir. Do you know the song? He doesn't know. You know what? You want to sing this? Yeah, please. Yeah. All, right. huh? All the girls are singers. That's, that's good. Uh, so it goes something like It's been a long day without you, my friend. I'll tell you all about it when I see you again. So every time I hear that song on the radio or whatever, I'm like, man, whoever played this song, you. Gosh, I'm not ready for it. But what it's telling me is like, yeah, like, it's it's a long road. Like, it's not easy. But I'll see you again. And that's how we understand this idea of, like, life as being a bridge. Like, it's not the end of the road when you die. It's just a change in state. You go from a physical being that we can all see to being somewhere else we don't. And to maybe get a better understanding of this, let's think of my, my nephew Adam. When he was in his mom's belly, right? Oh, that's, it has to be a twin. Let's think of this Adam. This is another Adam. <laughs> this Adam, his cousins with my Adam, um, has a twin brother. He's the cutest kid ever. Um, so when he... <laughs> say hi, Adam. Uh, <laughs> hi, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. So when he was in his mom's belly with his brother, they were saying, like, one of them was like, man, I can't wait to the next life. I'm going to meet my mom. I'm going to meet my sisters. And then the other one was saying, there is no next life. That's it. We're here. This is the life that we're going to live. Somebody want to open that? So when there's two kids in there, who's, who's right? Right? You're in this belly. You don't expect there's anything next. There's nothing 
stop them. Fix that distraction. It's the gin. Right. Oh my god. <laughs> Talk about topics I shouldn't bring up with nine-year-olds. <laughs> So in their tummy, in their mom's tummy, one of them is saying, there's nothing next after this life. How could there be? All they know is there is each other and they're talking. But one of them is saying, no, wait, there is something more. And he doesn't know that there is anything out there for sure. He doesn't see it, but he's told so. He believes it. And to me, that's kind of like a lesson in life. Like, we don't see what happens next. We don't know what's there. We're told about it. We're told stories about it. But we don't actually see it. And that's the kind of belief that you know, are you that kid in there that like doesn't believe it because you don't see it? Or you've been through it before. You've been in a phase where you don't see where you are or what's next, but you got a better belief it's there. And that really just does help. It helped me a lot, right? It helped me a lot to know that like my brother is not just no more. It's not like somebody I just don't see. The idea is I have a I have an opportunity to keep working and to do things until I can. Let me check the time. So fifty five is when we're done. Uh, ten o'clock. Okay. So, so I'll tell you a little bit of what I've been doing the past two years. Um, the night of the murders, I wanted to make a Facebook page so I can let people know about the genocide. Because when things like this happen, there's all kinds of like rumors that go around, whether it was how the person died, or who did it, or whatever. Just so everybody again has an opinion and wants to share it. I think with Snapchat, it's even worse. Like, everybody like, thinks they know. Um, so I wanted to make a page where it's like, officially through us, we know first name, what it was that happened, what the gen has that is, let there be no confusion. So I made the page called R3 Winners. I wanted, I thought like R3 Angels might work, but like, are they angels? The other sort of them were not angels. They were not made of light. They lived amongst us. But, Going back to this idea of life is a test, right? I believe they were winners. They had just gotten married to each other. Yusuf just got accepted to the same dental school as my brother, which is a top notch school. But then just received this like award from her architecture school one day, like the ingenuity and design. They were all individuals in the community who were non confrontational, who loved each other, who loved everybody around them. That no such thing as like had drama. If there was a girl that had drama with Yusuf, she'd go and invite her out. Like these were the people that lived their lives and you know, I don't know what happened that night, but I, I know that if life is a test, they won. So I came up with the name R3 Winners. And that kind of stuck to kind of represent who they were in the essence of life. There was plenty of losers. The dude who murdered Nabra, loser. Donald Trump? Just, just kidding. We, we actually don't know yet. Huh? We don't know yet, right? He, he has a chance. He's still alive. Um, yeah, three more years. Or whatever. We're not letting, not, not another term, but, but the idea is that, like, I mean, we don't necessarily know, like, he can change. But there are people out there that, like, what's that Taylor Swift song? Y'all know. Um, like, something about rocks that, um, people throw rocks at things that shine. Is that Taylor Swift? No. Am I the only one that listens to Taylor Swift? Yeah. yeah. I'm not going to sing Taylor Swift. It's something wrong. It's like, y'all got to look this up. It says, people throw rocks at things that shine. What does that mean? Yeah, it means exactly what it means. So, in this situation, like, honestly, when I think back to the situation of my brothers, the yeah, Yusuf were happy people, man. And they were happy despite the fact that they wore this hijab. Where in Craig Hicks' mind, the neighbor who murdered them obviously thought, you can't be religious and be happy. In his mind, religion doesn't play a thing. God doesn't exist. So I think as we go around and people see your smiling faces and see who you are, you guys are shining in the community. You guys are taking the attention that the community has and it's on you. And people throw rocks at things that shine sometimes. Some people sit and admire it, but some people are just going to be like, hey, let's we'll see what happens if I throw a rock at it. And what does happen when people throw rocks? You don't die, not always. Um, 
and it's not really a joke. Um, but the idea is that there's a there's a chance of coming together and being a team, playing as a team and being proud of ourselves. It was awesome to see the Muslim community come together for a black Muslim young girl, right? We came together for Nabra because we all know that her life matters. We know you cannot mess with the Muslims, man. You mess with the Muslims, we'll come to get you. Seriously, we're gonna be there. And Muslims, the thing is about Muslims is we want to see light happen in the world. We want to see love, right? So how do you accomplish that? How do you see more of that? In the aftermath of the Chapel Hill shootings, my brother left a property. So you know, usually when your mom and dad dies, you get a property inherited, maybe your house, maybe your business or something. In this way, it was just the opposite, right? My dad, my brother died, and my mom and my dad inherited a property that he, which is a property in downtown Raleigh. So we took that property, went to set it up as a sort of jariya. The idea, anything good that happens out of the house goes back to the fact that my brother helped make it happen. And he tweeted once, I have a dream that one day we'll have a structured and organized community and I'll be able to help youth with their projects. So we're doing exactly that out of the house. We're running uh, basically youth programs, an incubator, a shared office space, amazing things like tonight there's a DM there for the young professionals. So we're doing all this, but at the front of the house, as I was renovating it, I put a quote up. And the quote was, you could basically laser cut it into wood. At State University they have a laser cutter, which is like this really cool thing which like cuts right into wood. And we put it right up top. Assalamu alaikum. So um, I think there are some brothers and sisters who brought their coffee and tea inside. Uh, you know, with the carpet, we want to be extra careful. Uh, if it's got a plastic cup on, you know, we're kind of worried, concerned about that. So please do what you can to uh, be safe with that. We are asking that if you're going to drink a water bottle that it has a cap on it, so it, if it tips over, it won't mess up the carpet. And finally, there's a lost cell phone. It's a Sprint phone, iPhone, and uh, so if it's yours, uh, it's in the office. Just like okay. So the quote that goes around the front of the house and to the side is, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. So when faced with darkness, is what happened on February 10th, 2015, what happened this past Sunday, what happens in some day-to-day -day activities, the idea is that Muslims don't like that. They want to live in the light. God is light. They want to see more of that. So how do we respond? When we say we got you, we respond by putting more light into the world. We each become a beacon of light for each other. We come together and we become a beacon of light for the community at large as well. Not just the Muslim thing, man. We're out there doing great things for the rest of the world. You better believe it. And the rest of the quote is hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So for somebody to hate us for who we are, to hate what we represent, what they think we represent, what do we do? We don't respond with hate. What is that going to be good? It's going to be getting more hate. That's fighting fire with fire. What do we want to see? We want to see a little bit more love in the world. We believe that's possible. So you do not fight hate with hate. You fight it with love. And we respond with more love. And honestly, like, if I were to say there's a few things about Dias Razan and Nabra that I want to see right now, and I learned some of this obviously visiting, was that they were good to their parents. The last thing that Nabra did at home was she had an iftar for a bunch of her friends at her house. She left with her friends. A couple minutes later, she came back home. Her father felt like, or thought she, she forgot something. But what do you think she did? She came back just to tell him, I love you and thank you. You're not gonna reach a high level, the level that the other Shinrazan and Nabra could have achieved without them. The last text that my, that my brother had to my mom, can you guess? I love you. How crazy is that? The day after, so he was murdered on a Tuesday, on Wednesday, we were planning to feed about 50 of his like dental classmates. So just, just for fun, just, just to kind of do that, to say thank you for the awesome program. My brother was so proud of his school, so proud of his team, his, his classmates. So he wants to do that. And my brother said, 
I love you. Thank you. They were good to themselves. They were good to others. Be good to your parents, but smile. Care about other people. The last Facebook post my brother had was he was distributing dental dental uh, uh, kind of kit, like a toothbrush, toothpaste, stuff like that, floss, and food in downtown Durham. And it was in this like crazy like chain of events where like he was murdered as he was having a live GoFundMe campaign, launch the campaign. You carrying that? That's what it was. So he was pleading to people, and he was after Juma prayers every day, every Juma. He had these little baggies that he would sell for five dollars, and I will love you. I told him I was like, bro, you're not going to change the world five dollars at a time. These little baggies at a time, right? I mean, that's a mean thing to say. I know from me, brother. There's a lot of things I can say. I regret. But I told him you're not going to change the world like that. But I don't think it's up to us to change the world. I think it's up to us to kind of put in the effort, a pure intention, the good effort, and that's all we're responsible for. The results come from God. So he was at 16 of 20,000 to do dental relief for Syrian refugees on the Turkish border. So he planned the trip out. He knew exactly where we were going, who we were serving, how we were helping them. And was at 16 of 20,000. He was murdered like a week after putting up that video. And the question was then, how are people going to respond seeing this? They understood him as a person who wanted to give back to the community. This crowdfunding campaign grew to $600,000 in the aftermath of that murder. And every year we've been able to go to Turkey. That first year was the hardest, because the first year he planned it. And we get there, we're struggling to get there, we're taking our dental supplies, we're there, and then you're like, you look around and you think Ziyat should have been there, and you just like kind of cry and look off into the distance, looking into Syria, and you're just like, man, Ziyat should have been here. But we've been able to do it every year since then. They cared for others. They love their parents. But they also made mistakes. They're normal human beings, and I think that's the best part of it. Like, you, each of you have to believe that you can reach that position. Like, God loves you that much. And that's the hardest part, is really believing that God loves us. Like, did God really love my brother that much to give him such an honor? I guess the answer is yes. And it's in each and every one of us to kind of believe that within ourselves. And my last piece of advice Right? Time's up. But for those who have siblings, I told you I regret a lot. Just kind of like personally. And it kind of happened in a dream. And sometimes you have dreams of, of the people who pass. And honestly, this kind of wasn't a happy dream. So I was in the bedroom, my brother's bedroom, and there are two beds. There's a bed there and a bed here. In the dream, I was doing what that kid right there is doing. He doesn't even know we're talking about him. He's on the phone, distracted. Right? Yeah. Sorry, bro. <laughs> but the idea is that's what I was doing, man. We're distracted by life. We're over here, instead of being in the moment, instead of loving each other, instead of whatever, you're over here like, and I'm sure whatever you're doing is fine, like either you're trying to relax, or it was like talking to somebody important or whatever, like, it's not like we're doing bad, but we're not there in the moment. And to me, I was in my dream doing this on the bed, and my brother was next to me on his bed on the phone as well, and he was probably texting you said all these cute things. And I really wanted to turn to him and tell him I loved him, but I wasn't able to. So I wanted to tell him I loved him, but well, though, like, in the dream, like, my physical body couldn't turn to tell him. It was so sad when I woke up, and I felt like I couldn't tell my brother I loved him, despite of how much I missed him. Despite of what it is, you know, you know, you really don't know what you, you're missing until you lose it, kind of a thing. And that was like my advice to you guys: is tell your siblings, tell your parents, tell each other you love each other. Be here for each other, so you don't have that regret later on. And then how did it that through the mercy of God, a little bit over two weeks later? I had a dream where he was dressed in all white, large shoulders, happy. He came to me and did what? He hugged me, his signature bear hug, and he said, I love you. And I was able to say to him, I love you. And I woke up, well, like the happiest I've ever been in a long time. I think he knew I loved him, 
and I knew he loved me, but I got to say it. And that's literally like a story that you can take to the bank and like, just do more of it. And that's, that's all I need you to take from me today. It's to know to tell each other you love each other. And then really that's it.